thank you all for coming to the first talk in the second series of the Capitalist Mode of Power speaker series. Uh, I'm just going to offer a, a brief introduction to this talk um, and more generally the, the Forum on Capital's Power, which organized this talk. Uh, the Forum on Capital's Power is an uh, informal organization, and we're always looking for people who are interested in helping us organize subsequent events. Uh, so far, we've organized three conferences. Uh, we were due to have another conference this year in, in Ottawa. Uh, unfortunately, funding fell through, but a conference will be held next year. Uh, and this speaker series is substituting for that conference this year. Uh, as I said, this is the second speaker series. Um, everything that we do uh, is made uh, is, is presented on capitalispower.com. So anyone who is interested in the topics presented here, I encourage you to go to capitalistspower.com. Uh, and we can also be contacted through the website. Uh, the Forum on Capital is Power. Um, the fact that it's slightly informal is owing in part to the success of those who have participated in it as they go on to do other jobs. And frequently it is, or typically it has been graduate students who've been responsible for organizing these conferences. So again, if anyone is interested in helping us organize subsequent events, you are more than welcome. Uh, and the Forum on Capital's Power can be considered a nascent form of the research centers that Professor Nitzen frequently advocates for, something he sees this project um, developing into. Uh, this talk uh, is the work of Shimshon Bickler and Jonathan Nitzen, um, who met. Did you meet before you were graduate students? Before you were a student. So they've known each other for a long time, and this project has been developing over several decades, and it continues to be developed. Uh, and further, as the talk will highlight, it's no longer being developed just by professors Bickler and Nitzen. Um, there are many of us who are actively working on the concepts and developing ideas within the capital as power uh, perspective. Um, they have many publications, uh, and I think it's worth noting that all of the publications are available on their archives, bnarchives.net, uh, where many academics talk the talk about intellectual property rights. They walk the walk and make them freely available. Uh, the most recent publication is The Scientist and the Church. Uh, you can also access Capital's Power, the book, which is perhaps the most comprehensive detailing of the, the Capital's Power perspective. Uh, and as I noted, this is an ongoing project, they continue to develop the concepts and ideas uh, of capitalist power, the capitalist mode of power, and modes of power more generally. Uh, I'd like to give a thanks to Polly Sai and SPT for sponsoring this speaker series. And it's worth noting that this is going to be a longer presentation. Uh, Professor Nitzen says he'll talk for about an hour, then we'll have a 10 minute break. Uh, then he'll talk for another 50 minutes, uh, followed by a, a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, D.T. Co Cochran, Troy. He didn't present himself, uh, so I need to present him. My purpose today is to use a very broad brush to uh, pin the evolution of the CASP project. The acronym CASP actually was coined by Troy and it stands for capital as power. So this is a new radical approach to the study of capitalism. And as such, it contrasts sharply with both liberal and Marxist political economies. And the key premise of this approach, I think, is that capital is not a material productive entity. It's a symbolic representation of power. And that capital is not a narrow economic entity but a key social institution that creators, in other words, that creates the order of capitalist society. And because capital is viewed as a power institution, in other words, it's a dialectical and uh, an institution that negates things, it should be understood not in absolute terms, but in relative differential terms. Now, the CASP approach was born from my research with Shimshon Bichler, which we started when we were students back in the 1980s. 
And since then, the approach has broadened and deepened quite a bit, uh, and it's spread into new areas. Uh, it uh, introduced new concepts to better articulate what we had in mind. And in addition, and perhaps more importantly, CASP is now attracting young researchers, as Troy mentioned. And uh, these researchers push it into new directions, and they develop uh, new research empirically, but they also develop new theoretical insights. So some of these researchers will be presenting in the next few weeks uh, in the series, every Tuesday at the same time, and we will be posting the announcements, and, and you can follow, and you're invited to listen. Now, my presentation is subtitled Past, Present, and Future, and I will follow this progression quite naturally. So I will start with tracing the evolution of the CAS project from its inception in the 1980s all the way to the present. So that will be the first part, and then we'll take the break. And then I will describe some of the work that is done by the younger generation. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I try to sketch um, several possible trajectories for future research. Because as I see it, CASP is really in its infancy. So the principles are fundamentally different from both, li both liberalism and Marxism. And that means that every socio-historical phenomenon needs to be researched. So if you see the world through the spectacles of uh, CASP, the entire capitalist cosmos has to be reconceived and remapped. And of course, this work is merely it's in infancy, as I said, it's just beginning. So I would like to offer some suggestions on what might be some of the interesting trajectories that need to be followed and maybe uh, to persuade you to join the adventure. Uh, this is plenty of ground to cover in one presentation, even if it takes two hours. Uh, more than that, I need to tailor my presentation to the audience here. So some of the people here know virtually nothing about uh, CASP. And some my students maybe know a little bit. And there are also here experts who do CASP research, and they know quite a bit. So I need to make this presentation both accessible but also useful to all of you. And for this reason, I'll try to build some sort of an evolving picture of the project. So I will focus less on the specific details and more on some of the general lessons that I think uh, we have drawn and can be drawn from those details. And I'll try to also connect them and, and see and show you how they unfold uh, in each other. So let's begin with the past and begin with the word research. To research means to search again. This word dates back to the late 16th century in Middle French, rechercher. And, and that means to basically do something new, something different, something novel. And every graduate student uh, probably knows the drill. It's kind of a big threat. You need to specify your research question and to kind of articulate how are you going to uh, progress in your intellectual journey. And I think the ritual of setting up the research question is inspired by the founding fathers of science. So it's some sort of a salutation for the generation of Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and Descartes and, of course, Newton, and as well as their followers uh, from Faraday and Maxwell uh, to Jeremy Bentham, Adam Smith, and Karl Marx, to name a few. Now, these scientists broke new grounds. They doubted the concepts that surrounded them. They were looking for contradictions. They asked new questions. That's the most important thing. And eventually, they offered totally new ways of conceiving the world. So quite irrespective of their particular inclinations, these people were, were revolutionaries. They thought fundamental change. And they thought this change, even though they themselves often didn't know where they were heading. Uh, and it's not for nothing that uh, Arthur Kessler, in his famous uh, history of cosmology, called them the sleepwalkers. They were kind of you know, uh, hallucinating a little bit. Now, this revolutionary period is long gone. And 
the baffled sleepwalkers are now replaced by academic troopers. And uh, the academic troopers are marching the trotted path. So I think that few social researchers nowadays uh, look for truly new answers, let alone for truly new questions to ask. There is a template, and it's called find a gap in the literature. So once you found a gap in the literature, you jump in and you stick yourself there very safely. You're surrounded by experts from all sides. So you uh, basically review their work and you showcase your virtuosity by endless citations and references. Uh, you make sure you don't step on any toes too hard. And you make sure you flatter those people who you think are going to help you get a job at the end. And uh, you keep safely within the consensus as much as possible. And you don't ask divisive questions, as I was told by one professor here in the department. And you, if you can, you try to ask no question whatsoever. Uh, in job interviews, I sometimes ask the candidates, what was their biggest research failure? And what was the most surprising finding? And they look at me, what? And when they have this look in their eyes, I know. They've never fell on their face. They've never made any mistake. And the reason is quite simple, because they have never engaged in any sort of serious research. And I think that in that sense, uh, science, in the university at least, uh, has to a large extent been taken over by the academic church. John Robinson, the famous uh, economist, heterodox economist, who didn't win the Nobel Prize, although she was uh, certainly a candidate because she was a little bit too sympathetic to Fidel Castro, uh, she predicted, and I think she was right, that future generations of students, economists, will erect elegant seeming arguments in terms that they cannot define and we'll be busy searching for answers to unaskable questions. And I think this kind of little quote summarizes quite a lot of what happens in normal science in the academia. But it doesn't have to be that way. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the dialogue between theories and facts. And I'm very much aware that I'm entering here a philosophical minefield of a sort, and that facts and theory are never really quite independent because they're both kind of related uh, to the same dogma. Uh, but indulge me in this kind of inquiry. On the one hand, the spread over the last several decades of anti-science postmodernity conditioned many uh, social scientists in the academia to treat facts as if they were figments of, um, of our imagination and therefore for the most part, quite irrelevant. On the other hand, the spread of electronic computing and electronic communication enabled those who do use facts to treat them uh, as if they're trivial. The facts are easily accessible in large quantities, often for free. They're kind of at our fingertips, or more accurately, at the fingertips of our research assistants. Uh, they are uh, kind of no-brainer. And I beg to differ on both of these views. I think that the facts are neither irrelevant nor trivial. I very much agree that the facts are always problematic, for sure. As I said, they always refer to some sort of dogma or some sort of preconception and some sort of bias, so they don't emerge <laughs> out of nothing. But they're always necessary. They are necessary in the sense that without them, you can do nothing, I think. You cannot theorize, really, and certainly you can never change the world without them. So let me try to illustrate and, and flesh up out this point by going back to our student years when Shimshon and I just started our research in Israel of the early 1980s. So Shimshon was working on his MA at the Hebrew University in Political Science, and I studied for the BA at McGill University in the Department of Economics. And we were interested in Israel for two reasons. First, we were Israelis, so that's kind of natural that we were interested in the country we came from. But more generally, Israeli, Israel was a very perplexing case. Th there was some sort of a kind of a, an ant antinomy, it seemed to us. On the one hand, you had a country 
mirrored in a severe crisis. So you had a very severe stagflation. Stagflation means stagnation plus inflation. So inflation was approaching 500%, and the country was mirrored in massive stagnation, very low growth rates, very high unemployment. Secondly, the country was engaged in military conflicts with its Arab neighbors, as well as with its Palestinian population indigenously. Uh, and it had very large military budgets. At some point, the military budget accounted for about one third of the GDP. So, you know, compared to the US now, it's about five or six percent. Uh, the foreign debt was ballooning and going higher and higher, and that made Israel increasingly dependent on the United States. So it was losing its sovereignty in some way. And last but not least, there was a massive legitimation crisis. So in 1977, there was what Israeli called the earthquake, in which the uh, Zionist social democratic structure was collapsing, and there emerged the rule of the radical right. So this is the period in time in which characters such as Benjamin Netanyahu uh, were making the first steps. So the entire country was in turmoil. At the same time, if you look at the other side of this process, you see the stock market is booming, and you see the large corporations uh, earning huge profits relative to the underlying population, but also relative to the rest of the business sector. So to us, this seemed to be uh, a very uh, perplexing situation. Is it possible for accumulation to occur despite a massive crisis at all levels? In fact, is it possible for accumulation to occur through crisis? So the idea of accumulation through crisis was kind of building up in our head, although we couldn't uh, at that time articulate it in those terms. Now, most Israelis, then and now, uh, lived with their eyes wide shut. Uh, the economic reality for them was and remained quite independent from the political and the military reality. These are kind of different spheres in their head. But for us, they seem totally enfolded in one another. And we looked for ways of understanding that enfoldment theoretically to see how economics and politics are possibly kind of intimately related and how the micro and the macro are connected. So we tried to put things together rather than to keep them apart. So at that time, we were looking naturally towards critical understandings of capitalism. And we were very much attracted by the work of the Monopoly Capital School that was formulated in the US uh, with people such as Michael Kaletsky and Joseph Stendhal, and most famously, Baran and Sweezy. Now, their argument was developed with respect to the US mostly, and it was against the backdrop of Vietnam and against the backdrop of kind of the end of the big boom and the beginning of stagnation. Uh, but it was rather general, and, and we felt that it might have been relevant to the Israeli case. And just very briefly, what the Monopoly Capital School argued was that capitalism shifted from a competitive footing to an oligopolistic footing. And that changed the dynamics of that system. So oligopolies are very good at cutting <coughs> cost. So the costs tend to fall. Because they are oligopolies, they tend not to compete over prices. So there's a tendency for inflation to exist. So prices tend to rise. So you have cost falling and prices rising. And that creates a growing gap which they refer to as the surplus. And they refer to most uh, more concretely as the tendency of the surplus to rise as a share of national income. So that meant for them that there was a redistribution of income towards capital. And that redistribution actually undermined aggregate demand. So it created stagnation. So on the one hand, we have inflation. On the other hand, we had stagnation. In other words, we have stagflation. And they suggested that the only way for capitalism to counteract that is to absorb those rising surpluses through wasteful spending, particularly on the financial sector and the military. And that seemed to us very relevant to the Israeli case. 
In the Israeli case, there was also the added uh, institution of the settlements, which were absorbing a lot of surplus, if you like, in our opinion at the time. So there were, again, another way of counteracting that tendency and a lot of spending on all sorts of religious organizations, which are, again, uh, wasteful from a, a so-called economic perspective. So it seemed to us kind of an ideal starting point to understand the Israeli reality. And this, we said to ourselves quite naively, why won't we take this theory and just test it with respect to Israel? It seemed to be kind of ready-made and, you know, it made complete sense. Uh, well, that was uh, sort of a naive starting point. You know, uh, Leonard Cohen has this song, Everybody Knows. And uh, I think that this title uh, is quite pertinent to the way many academics uh, have grown accustomed to see the world. Everybody knows these days about shock therapy, and everybody knows about disaster capitalism, and everybody knows that the crisis enriches the rich, and everybody knows that the top 1% continue to increase their share of national income no matter what. And everybody knows that distribution matters a great deal, suddenly. So somehow all of those things suddenly became self-evident facts. Everybody knows them. But let me tell you that in Israel of the early 80s, nobody knew those things. And I say virtually nobody. Uh, and nobody knew those things because the facts didn't exist. And the fact didn't exist because nobody was interested in the facts, these facts, and nobody uh, was doing anything about, you know, making those facts appear. In the uh, preface to uh, Galileo's uh, book, that was originally published in the 17th century called Dialogue Concerning the Chief Two World Systems. Albert Einstein wrote that there is no empirical method without speculative concepts and systems, but also there is no speculative thinking whose concepts do not reveal on closer investigation the empirical methods from which they stem. So what he's saying here is that Induction and deduction have to go hand in hand. You can, you can be rigid about it, but you better not be rigid if you are engaged in scientific research. The two are intertwined, and they are intertwined in a very dynamic way. Uh, they kind of uh, reciprocate one another, and they feed on one another dialectically. And I, I, I think that I'm not going to be very uh, wrong in saying that this dialogue between the facts and the theories between uh, induction and deduction uh, is the key fountain of novelty. Now, in the early 1980s, nobody, and I again mean nobody, knew the facts about the large Israeli firms, the large corporations. We spent two months as students trying to piece together the most basic financial series about the performance of those firms going back to their founding years. And very quickly, we realized that this history didn't exist anywhere. In fact, what we realized was that the raw data, in other words, the financial reports themselves, remember, this is the 1980s, so the, the, I think that the personal computer appeared only in 1982. I took the first course at McGill on the IBM PC. There were two PCs in the entire university, and they had those kind of five and a quarter uh, floppy disks. They were really floppy. So this was not yet computerized. So you need to have the actual printed reports. And even the printed reports did not exist in one collection in any one place. So we went to the Central Bureau of Statistics, and they had only a very small sample. We went to the Central Bank, same thing. We went to the Ministry of Finance. We went to the National Library. The National Library has to hold two copies of any print that you know, is published in the country. So they have to have two copies of any financial report. And they had only a very small sample. So nobody had the raw data even. And we spent a couple of months you know, trying to fit this puzzle. And in retrospect, this indifference to the data uh, seems not really surprising. Because at the time, most Israeli academics uh, that deal with society uh, 
subscribe to the statist dogma. So what that means is that they thought of the state as the kind of the central focal interest. And Israel was, in their opinion, a socialist society, at least until recently. So the capitalist group were just kind of a sideshow. Who cares about them? And even if they are there, you know, they're not really important and they're not really interesting. So most of the academics we spoke about with looked at us, at us as if we were just crazy. Uh, what are you doing? I mean, they had no idea of where we're driving at. And the same thing with the capitalists. The capitalists, the owners of the corporations, they're not interested in the history. They're interested in the future. They want to make money you know, looking forward. And history doesn't make you any money. So why bother about collecting this information? It's, it's quite useless. So nobody cared. So the facts didn't exist. And because the facts didn't exist, there was nothing to theorize. So we end up with an interesting anomaly. We end up with a situation in which everybody in the street knows about those firms because they are their employers. They provide all the consumer goods and producer goods that they consume. They dominate their mindset because they control entertainment and so on and so forth. So they're everywhere. And the experts think that they are uh, not there. So the holding groups were everywhere and nowhere. And obviously, we didn't think that way. And for us, the emperor was uh, not naked. The emperor was there and was very well dressed. And we thought that the large corporations were very crucial. And we spent a lot of time piecing that thing together. And eventually, uh, we came up with an entity that uh, we later called dominant capital, a large Israeli conglomerates. And even that decision was kind of not born out of nothing. We had to decide uh, you know, what to include, what to exclude. There were many, many issues with the data. And I'm going to talk about it later, uh, about the question of accounting. But for the time being, I leave it aside. The thing is that we came up with a new entity, which later we called dominant capital. And what do I mean by dominant capital? Well, from the very start, this concept was fundamentally different from prevailing conceptions of capital. We didn't think about it as a productive economic category, as most economists do. We didn't think about it as a political entity. And uh, we didn't think it had anything to do with SNM as well. Uh, as we saw it, uh, dominant capital was the epicenter of the political economy. It was the explicate appearance of modern capital at large. And we called it dominant capital because it was totalizing. So dominant capital forced itself and constantly transformed and creordered everything else. It dominated not only the narrow domain of what social scientists call the economy, but it dominated and transformed the entire society. Now, initially, this totalizing view was rather fuzzy in our head. But one thing was clear to us from the very start, even though the concept, uh, concept itself was not yet. In order to analyze dominant capital, we had to think of accumulation in very different terms from the ways that neoclassicists and Marxists thought about them. We couldn't think about it in utilitarian terms. And we couldn't think about it in terms of technology and labor. It seemed to us that it was fundamentally connected to power. So this was not yet capital as power, but the idea already flickered in the back of our heads, although we didn't realize it. Secondly, once we shifted the emphasis to power, and once we created this new entity we call dominant capital, it meant that we need a new unit. And again, we couldn't use absolute units because in economic theory, both heterodox and mainstream, the units are absolute. So the neoclassicists use the util, and the Marxists use socially necessary abstract labor time or snout. But these were not going to work if you think about power. So we need to think in units of power. And units of power cannot be absolute. They have to be relative. So at that point in time, we already start to think of accumulation as a differential process, as a relative process. So we have here, right from the very start, from the very first years, asking very simple questions. You know, 
what is the financial performance of those large corporations that we see everywhere, that already gave rise to the twin concepts of dominant capital and differential accumulation. So we, it seemed to us that we need to, if we are to investigate the co-evolution of capital accumulation on the one hand and ruling class formation on the other, on the other hand, we need to focus on dominant, the dominant capital groups at the center of the process, along with the state organs in which they are embedded and to which they are related. And secondly, that the principal method that we should use is to focus not on growth, absolute growth, and not on absolute well-being, but we should focus from the very start on differential distribution and redistribution. So this is way before Piketty and you know, Stiglitz and these people. Uh, this is in the 1980s, and it corresponds to something that seemed to us actually quite trivial. And at the time, uh, it was not understood and not emphasized uh, by anybody with the exception of a very small group of people. So some of you who might know a little bit our, on our work, you can see here already the beginning of a shift from kind of a Newtonian to a Leibnizian uh, space. In other words, the entities that we looked at are not just entities that uh, exist in a space that is predetermined, but they define the space themselves. So these large entities of dominant capital and the way they are connected to one another differentially, the very existence and dynamics define the space and alter the space in which they exist. So this emphasis on the twin concept of dominant capital and differential accumulation immediately spawned a series of bigger questions. So once you start engaging with the data, you start asking questions about categories. And once you deal with categories, immediately questions arise uh, with respect to theories. So the first thing that uh, we questioned was the conventional separation between politics and economics. And then we move to the conventional distinction between real and nominal in the economy. And then we asked ourselves, well, when we speak about accumulation, what are the regimes of accumulation? Because most economists emphasize economic growth and price stability as the most conducive things for accumulation. It seemed to us that, in fact, mergers and acquisitions and stagflation are equally, if not more important. And then this led to even bigger questions. Uh, what is capital and what is the capitalist system? So out of that came the issue that capital might be power rather than some sort of a material productive thing. And that instead of speaking about uh, a capitalist mode of production, we might want to speak about the capitalist mode of power. And if we speak about the capitalist mode of power, what are the limits or what are the asymptotes of that mode of power? And finally, last but not least, all of these questions suggested that we might need to think of a different method of inquiry, uh, a different methods of research. So as you can see, sort of it opened a Pandora box. And I, wh what I want to do in the rest of the presentation, at least in the first part, is try to flesh out some of these questions and to see how they e evolved historically. So I will begin with the. Uh, distinction between politics and economics. Israel's dominant capital was deeply involved in the country's military conflicts. So both, as I said, in the wars with neighbors as well as the domestic conflict with the Palestinians. And it was involved in, a, in many different ways. So first of all, the owners and officers of these groups were very much intertwined through kinship relationship, administrative relationship, uh, military relationship and ownership ties with the rest of the ruling class, or what C. Wright Mills called at the time uh, the power elite in the country. Uh, it was involved in setting up policies, and most importantly, it was involved in getting, essentially, most of the domestic military budgets and controlling most of the military exports that came out of Israel. Now, we were very excited because now we had the data about these firms, and we said, well, let's look at the connection between the militarization of the society and these holding groups that we call dominant capital. 
And what we found out was quite startling. It just, just jumping at us from the page. It looked at this, the performance of these firms, the differential performance. In other words, we looked at the profits of these firms as a share of national income. They were very tightly correlated with military spending as a share of national income and very tightly correlated with military export as a share of national income. So these firms were actually benefiting tremendously from the militarization of the society. And this relationship pointed to a central question, a much broader question that we started to ponder. If dominant capital is so intertwined with the foreign and domestic politics of the country, in this case through military spending and military exports, but also through other means, for example, uh, monetary policy and taxation, or uh, the setting up of different laws, or the relation to religion and so on, communication, education, you know, different forms of political activities, can we still think of capital as an economic entity that is somehow separate from the political sphere? And it seems to us that if every dollar of profit can be related in this way to uh, the political sphere, then the conventional bifurcation between politics and economics uh, is very problematic. And the notion that somehow capital belongs to the economic sphere and not to the political sphere actually prevents us from understanding what is going on. So accumulation, we started to uh, realize, was not a narrow economic process. It was a very totalizing process. It wasn't simply about uh, making capitalists rich or making workers productive and subservient or about the economy growing. It was about transforming the entire society. It was the generative order or the creorder of capitalist society in large. Now, this breakup of the politics-economics duality, to our mind, was evident from the way that corporations grow. So in the first article that we wrote together, which was published as a discussion paper at uh, McGill University, it was published in 1998. And it was about, it was called, I think, Aggregate Concentration and the Israeli Economy. And we compared in the nature of concentration in Israel with the US. And what we did was to take the leading firms and take their average size, compare it to the average firm in each society. So what is the size of a top dominant uh, capital firm in Israel relative to the average? And what is the same thing in the US? And we compared the two. So it turned out that in 1962, Israeli, Israel's dominant capital groups were about uh, 15 times larger than the US counterparts relative to their own average. And in eight, 1982, 20 years later, the number was already 125. So that's kind of an eightfold increase. So Israel was uh, incredibly concentrated. And we knew quite immediately that uh, this growth did not happen through greenfield investment. It happened through mergers and acquisition. And that happened in Israel. That's the way it happened in the US. That's the way it happens in every advanced capitalist society. So why do economists, both Marxist and neoclassical, insist that they should ignore mergers and acquisitions? Well, and, and they should emphasize only greenfield growth. Well, one reason is that mergers and acquisitions are not economic activity. They're just about ownership. It's about the change in ownership. So they don't promote growth. In fact, many mergers and acquisitions undermine growth because they involve sort of rationalization and cutbacks and so on. And we're still, mergers and acquisitions are kind of a, a deeply political process. And what we suggested at the time was that they are the major driver of jurisdictional integration. They integrate the industry first, then they integrate the sector then they integrate the entire sort of national envelope. And finally, they integrate the entire world. So, you know, you have now the Trans-Pacific Partnership that kind of is in the news. It's part of this process of jurisdictional integration. And a lot of this is driven by the urge to merge. So this is a political event, but nevertheless, it happens at the corporate level. It happens at the economic level. And the distinction between politics and economics here is very disturbing. <clears throat> now, mergers in o is only one side of the story. Uh, as I already uh, mentioned, Israel experienced very intense stagflation in the 1980s. It wasn't unique to Israel. All countries experienced stagflation at the time, but Israel was a very pronounced case. 
And what was fascinating is that it, this was supposedly a crisis, but it did not undermine really the performance of the large firms, on the contrary. So we actually tested it, and it seemed that the differential performance of the large firms relative to the entire economy and relative to the business sector more specifically was very tightly and positively correlated with stagflation. The more the stagflation, the greater the differential performance of these firms. So they didn't suffer from this crisis. On the contrary, they benefited from it redistributionally in a very, very important way. So in our mind, this finding kind of pulled the rug from under the entire edifice of economics. Uh, following the British philosopher David Hume, economists tend to separate economic life into real and nominal sphere. The real sphere is where all the important action is. So this is production and consumption, utility, productivity, exploitation, conflict, well-being, technical change, all of those things happen at the real sphere. And the nominal sphere is just a kind of a giant mirror. It's a quantitative sphere above that reflects the underlying reality of economics. And this conventional creed leads to the conclusion that because the nominal sphere, in other words, money, finance, and prices, is just a reflection of the real thing, it doesn't really matter. It's neutral. Inflation is neutral. Inflation is when prices generally rise. Deflation is when prices generally fall. When that happens, uh, nothing really happens underneath. And you know, very famous Israeli economist claimed that inflation is neutral. Don Patenkin, uh, Bruno, you know, world famous economists, they argue inflation is neutral. Look, it is neutral. Uh, but we found that it wasn't neutral. Now, obviously, nobody asked the questions that we asked because these data did not exist and the holding companies did not exist as for all intent and purposes. So Milton Friedman at the time, after he won the Nobel Prize, famously said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And that might be the case, sure. But it is also, and much more importantly, and maybe the raison d'etre of inflation is that it's always and everywhere a redistributional phenomenon. And we also realized, first in Israel, but then in other countries, that contrary to the conventional creed, Inflation did not tend to come with growth. It tend to come, tended to come with stagnation. In other words, it appeared as stagflation. And moreover, this was not an anomaly. In fact, it was the normal situation. So in country after country, we realized that whenever there is inflation, in fact, there's also stagnation. So stagflation is the norm. In other words, the story here is completely different from what uh, one, the one that is portrayed by the conventional creed. Inflation is always and everywhere a redistributional phenomenon, and that proved itself in subsequent works from anybody who has done CASP research. So we should not speak about inflation. We should speak about differential inflation. And secondly, inflation always is created, or differential inflation is created and mediated through some form of sabotage, some form of crisis. So unemployment, stagnation, and so on is kind of the necessary thing for inflation to exist. And it's not just unemployment that takes the form of sabotage. So I, I will now venture, venture into something else that we have done. We looked at military spending in Israel because they were so important. It's, as I said, at some point, it was one third of GDP. But obviously, that occurred because Israel was in the Middle East. So it was very important to situate the Israeli case in the broader arena of the Middle East so we looked at Middle East conflicts and what we call energy conflicts in the Middle East. And we thought that just as these <laughs> forms of crisis, quote unquote, in Israel were connected positively with the performance of large firms in Israel, maybe conflict in the Middle East is connected positively with the large firms that are operating in the Middle East. So we looked at the oil companies, what we call the petrocore. So these are the largest global privately owned firms that operated in the Middle East. And we looked at their profitability in differential terms. In other words, relative to the average. And we compared them to the largest Fortune 500. 
And what we saw was a remarkable relationship in the Middle East. What happened was that conflict in the Middle East tended to cause oil price inflation, the rise in the price of oil, to be faster than general price inflation. And that obviously benefited the oil companies relative to other firms. And we found three remarkable regularities. The first regularity was that since the 1960s, every energy conflict in the Middle East was preceded by the oil companies trailing the average. So whenever the oil companies were falling behind dominant capital in general, you should expect a crisis to occur in the Middle East. Every such crisis was followed by the oil companies beating the average. And there was no case with one exception in which the oil companies managed to beat the average without there being a crisis in the first place, an oil energy crisis in the first place. So what this taught us essentially is that the oil companies were beating the average not on the back of production and not on the back of growth, but on the back of differential prices, differential price changes. And that differential price change was driven by the most vicious sabotage of all, war. So that's another way of thinking about stagflation. <clears throat> now, this crucial role of, stag of inflation and stagflation in the process of accumulation led us to question uh, the very meaning of reality in capitalism. And what philosophers call epistemology. What is the epistemology of capitalism that we should you know, kind of think about? And economists hold the monopoly of uh, this term of the capitalist reality. So as far as they're concerned, this reality has some universal units. The Marxists say that it's snout, and uh, the neoclassicists say uh, it is utils. And with these units, they claim to be able to describe and measure that reality. But in fact, I think that they are engaged in a fiction because these elementary particles of util, socially necessary abstract labor are, uh, are not observed. In fact, I think they're not observable. They cannot be measured. And in fact, what happens, and we have just written a paper on it, Capital Accumulation, Fiction, and Reality. Uh, in practice, economists go in reverse. They look at prices and they deduce from those prices something about utils or something about socially necessary abstract labor. All the measurements that we have of economic growth or the real capital stock or real consumption, uh, they're bogus measures. They're measures of prices that economists assume and everybody else along with them represent something universal at the real level. But in fact, they just represent prices. So we concluded several times uh, that <laughs> economics, for that reason, is uh, an edifice built on foundations of quicksand. But if capitalism doesn't have some real magnitudes at the basis of production and consumption, what is the capitalist reality that we are talking about? What constitutes that reality? And we didn't yet have a fully articulated answer to this question, but the idea seemed to us quite clear because the price of capital seemed to us meaningful only in relation to other prices. So this is a differential thing. Differential relations were describing power relations. And therefore, the reality of capitalism is a reality of power. And that, that is the thing we should really focus on. Now, these inquiries have eventually led us to think that maybe we need to study capitalism in a totally different way. So we need to really revolutionize the study of capitalism. And we need to think about it uh, not as a mode of production as, and consumption, but as a mode of power. And that we need to think of universalizing the way that capitalism quantifies different power relations. And it does so through finance. So the financial reality seems to us a reality that is quantifiable, it's entirely quantitative, and it reflects power relations. And that led us to emphasize this concept of differential capitalization. Capitalization uh, 
essentially is the discounting to present value of expected future incomes corrected for risk. And in order to understand how this process actually is constructed, I think it's useful to go back to Democritus, who invented the atom. Uh, and maybe even earlier to the Sumerians who invented the building block. We need to think of what are the building blocks of finance and capitalization more specifically. And we call those the elementary particles. That's the language of contemporary physicists. And the elementary particles of the neoclassicist is the util, of the Marxist is the snout. We need our own elementary particles. So we looked at the formula of capitalization. And capitalization essentially is a ritual that every finance student prays to every day. But in fact, all of you are obedient to because it governs the world. And we asked ourselves, what are the components of it? And we said, that, well, the components are future earnings, hype, which is optimism and pessimism, the normal rate of return and risk. Each of those four components that we call the elementary capitals, uh, particles is deeply related to power relations, and we need to investigate those. These are the components that we need to unpack if we are to understand the way that capitalism operates. So this was our starting point, the elementary particles. And we used those elementary particles recently by thinking about the asymptotes of capitalist power, the limits of capitalist power. Now, we, when anybody talks about capitalist power, there's kind of uh, immediately the notion of omnipotence. Capital is very, very powerful, and it becomes ever more powerful. And eventually, it will become completely irresistible and unbeatable. But I think that that's a very, very wrong uh, approach to take. Because if you look at history, uh, every social system, when it reaches its apex, tends to either wither or eventually collapse. So the peak point of power is usually the most vulnerable point. And it's not too early to start to investigate what are the asymptotes of power. What are the limits of power? And I think if you start to ask this question, at that point, you look at the elementary components, the elementary particles of capitalization, and try to figure out how those elementary particles are running into barriers. What are the limits on them? And we have done some research on it with respect to the United States. And we concluded that the United States is actually approaching currently the asymptotes of capitalist power. Although this is a very preliminary research, and it's just on the US, and you need to take a global perspective, and it is a very sort of cursory study. But it was very useful to understand or try to test the power of this approach. Now, last but not least, before we take the break, I want to speak about science and the church. Uh, the most important thing in science, from what we learned, are the questions. And what we learned was that often the simplest, seemingly most naive questions are the best questions. This is what I always tell my students when they come to my office to ask, to ask or to talk about the research projects. And they come with some sort of grand ideas and say, well, come down to earth. Don't ask those big questions. Ask the simple one. It always gets more complicated. Start from the beginning and ask the most naive questions. Uh, it worked really well for us. And I suggest that you don't be shy and you follow that principle. And uh, don't be intimidated if you are surprised, because those simple questions will surprise you. The complicated questions are very difficult to answer, but they don't really deal anymore with the important things. Now, of course, it's not easy to ask questions. And it's even more hard to answer them, even if you are curious even if you're willing, even if you're eager. It's very hard to ask questions. And I think the main reason is that science doesn't work in a vacuum. You might not know that, that, the main that this is the main reason, but I think it is the main reason. Because when you ask simple questions, immediately you run into massive opposition. You run into massive opposition from the conservative forces of society that don't want you to ask simple questions. They want you to find gaps in the literature not the fundamental questions. 
And then you run into the state, against the state. Um, some of you may know very well that when you're starting to write your shirk applications. You know, how do I tone down? How do I conceal what I really want to do and make sure that when it goes to the powers that be, uh, they don't see what I really want to do. And slowly you start seeing the world through shirk rather than you know, having shirk see the world through your eyes. So you, f you are facing the state, you are facing organized religion, you're facing the capitalists to finance certain things and do not finance others. And of course, you're facing the academic church. Uh, Max Planck, uh, one of the most famous figures in uh, physics at the turn of the century, the previous century, is reputed to have said that science progresses one funeral at a time. So, you know, when the existing guards is buried, then there is a little window of opportunity to say something else. But remember, this window of opportunity is open only for a very brief period of time because immediately there is somebody running to fill this gap in the literature, right? So personally, we have run into this barrier from the very start. Uh, the academics have put uh, a contract on our student work, literally. So, Shimshon wrote a PhD dissertation at the Hebrew University called The Political Economy of Military Spending. And I wrote my MA dissertation in McGill called Holding Groups in the Israeli Economy. And both of these dissertations were sent to reviewers with the explicit instruction to fail them. And they failed them, both. Uh, and both of us engage in you know, legal struggles uh, to reinstate them. Uh, our papers have been repeatedly rejected. They still are repeatedly rejected, uh, including by heterodox journals on many different pretexts, often unrelated to what is in the papers. Our research has been repeatedly plagiarized by experts all the way from California to London. Uh, we found it quite hard to secure university jobs. My job here is a fluke, and fortunately I'm a uh, headless nail, you know? Once you're stuck, you can't be pulled out. <laughs> but, but, but Shimshon uh, wasn't that lucky. In fact, he's been blacklisted in every possible university, the Seven Sisters in Israel, and he never managed to secure an academic job. So he has, you know, all a kind of uh, zapping labor type of jobs. And the list goes on. But the church, no matter how powerful it is, is not omnipotent. In fact, the very fact that the church is so aggressive in putting up any fire that is lit by an inquisitive mind means that it's actually quite afraid of those fires. So there is what I call the Greek triangle, which is democracy, philosophy, science, that is stuck in every atom of your brain. And you know, the atom, once you unleash its powers, has an enormous energy in it. And it's there in every one of you. And it's being held there by all sorts of very strong forces to make sure that it doesn't explode. And the question is, how do we unleash that power of creativity? So maybe we'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll try to discuss that question. So the question that I asked at the end of uh, the past section was how do you unleash this creativity? <clears throat> and I think that creativity is created through cooperation and dialogue. It's not just in your head. It's the dialogue that you have with your predecessors. It's the dialogue that you have with yourself. It's the dialogue that you have with others around you. Uh, the word Ubuntu uh, means that I'm a human being through you. And I think there's a lot to it. Uh, and I'd like to kind of give an example of cooperation from the field of mathematics. The most cooperative thinker, or one of the most cooperative thinkers ever, uh, was the Hungarian number theorist, Paul Erdős. Uh, Paul Erdős published uh, almost 1,500 articles in mathematics, maybe only second to Gauss. <clears throat> and almost all of them were jointly authored. There is the famous uh, Erdős number project, uh, 
And if you search it on the internet, you will find it and you can read about it. Erdős zero is Erdős himself. Erdős one is somebody who published with Erdős. Erdős two is somebody who published with somebody who published with Erdős. And last I checked, the largest Erdős number was Erdős 18. So they kind of mapped all the lineages. Einstein was Erdős two. Uh, so Erdős is the arc. Uh, cooperator, if you like. The other extreme in mathematics is maybe illustrated by Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles was a number theorist, just like Erdős, who managed to prove Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem is uh, the most stubborn mathematical riddle ever, and it stood unproven for 358 years until Andrew Wiles come and came and cracked it open. Now, the key thing for us about Andrew Wiles is that, unlike Erdős, he worked in total isolation for about 80 years. The only person who knew he was trying to prove Fermat's last theorem was his wife. Uh, but even him, who didn't really cooperate, uh, at least on the face of it, did cooperate, because he cooperated with all of his predecessors. And he certainly cooperated, although unbeknown to them, with his contemporaries. Now, I think that I won't be terribly wrong in saying that if Shimshon and I have managed to achieve anything, it is because we have cooperated. If we uh, each worked on our own, I think we would have not achieved anything. Uh, cooperation and dialogue helped us tease ideas that otherwise would have remained buried. It sort of forced us to be very persistent in developing ideas. It helped us formulate questions that otherwise we would not dare to actually ask because we were talking. Uh, it helped us research things that otherwise would seem way too daunting to research. Uh, and it's not just because we are two, but because we encouraged each other. It had helped us uh, essentially dismiss conclusions that were too tempting to draw. Uh, they seemed too easy. And, and because we were two, we decided that we, we were sufficiently critical to dismiss them. And most importantly, it, it helped us withstand attacks of the church, which was uh, you know, this attack is continuous and it's been quite vicious. So it's very difficult to withstand it alone. In fact, you tend to often, often give up before you even go into the fight if you are alone. So cooperation is absolutely certain. And I'm convinced of that because I've been cooperating for more than 30 years on a very sort of intimate basis. But two people is not enough. They don't constitute critical mass. So for new ideas to develop, you need a growing research dialogue, something that existed in ancient Greece, maybe something that existed in the Olympia circle of Einstein in Zurich, maybe something that existed in the Copenhagen circle of Niels Bohr. These are the kind of the cooperative dialogues out of which explosions of ideas come from. And <clears throat> that's why when activists ask me, OK, so what should we do? Uh, said, slow down. What you need is 10 research institutes. And these research institutes need to be autonomous. They need to be non-academic. And if you are able to put together 10 research institutes in the world, you made a first significant step to changing the world. There is an enormous up, uh, pent up autonomous energy in the world, but most of this energy is not directed properly. Uh, <clears throat> You need to know what you want. And in order to know what you want, you need to know what exists, rather than to appropriate the opinions of others who tell you what exists. And I think that means a radical autonomous and therefore non-academic research. Because academia, you are immediately going to be attacked by the academic church. Just think of Rockefeller, who basically built the University of Chicago. And think of the thousands and thousands of research institutes that kind of pop up all everywhere. Uh, and essentially, they are the foundations of dogma. You know, what kind of novelty came out from those research institutes? Usually zero, because these institutes are trying to uh, 
fortify what exists and add on to that the destruction that is spread by postmodernity that is anti-scientific and you end up with something quite devastating. So if you are to change the world in some serious way, you need to understand it. And in order to do that, you need your own autonomous research. And that's really important. <clears throat> I don't think that uh, we have those institutes yet. I know we don't, but we have the beginning. Uh, we have uh, the website called Capitalist Power. This kind of a virtual locus for dialogue between people interested in capitalist power. And for the moment, the main people who participate in this dialogue are graduate students and young professors who have just earned their PhDs. And you might be interested in knowing that many of these people came to CASP with little or no background in the subject. Most of them had no background in economics at all. And most importantly, uh, none of them literally has done any research. And yet, and that's very remarkable, in a period of very few years, all of them have become global experts on the subjects. But not only global experts, but innovative experts, inventing new things. Uh, and doing very path-breaking research, I think, and that's just the beginning. So, and what follows, what I'll try to do is to give you some sort of a sample of uh, what some of uh, this research looks alike. And you are welcome to read more about it in capitalistpower.com as well as in the Bichler and Nitzan archives, which is our website. So I will begin with uh, June Park and Jordan Brennan. They uh, offered country studies, uh, which are not very different from the ones that we have done on Israel. June Park, who is currently a researcher, a research fellow at Sogang University in Seoul, wrote his PhD on dominant capital and the transformation of Korean capitalism uh, from the Cold War to globalization. And Jordan Brennan, who is currently an economist with the trade union Unifor, wrote his thesis on the business of power and Canadian multinationals in the post-war era. Now, these are the first two CASP examinations of two mid-sized capitalist countries. We dealt with the small size countries uh, as a population of less than Chicago. Uh, and they take a long-term historical perspective and they explore the growth of dominant capital in those countries and its regimes of accumulation in relationship to, uh, uh, to government policies and the evolution of the state on the one hand and the evolution of globalization on the other. And although they uh, do not uh, sorry, although they uh, do not necessarily draw conclusions that are always consistent with CASP uh, or with our uh, initial uh, suggestion and hypothesis, uh, they enrich CASP tremendously because just through that research, they raise all sorts of new questions and they offer some very new and startling findings. Uh, Joseph Baines, who is currently... Uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the LSC and just completed his dissertation last year, uh, wrote it on the global food regime. And one of his most stunning charts shows the differential uh, profitability of the large grain traders. So their performance relative to the S&P or uh, the CompuStat 500. And what he shows that the differential profitability goes up and down with global hunger. So that's kind of a startling thing because it has to do with differential inflation on the one hand and differential sabotage of the most uh, kind of terrible nature, which is hunger. So how do you sort of associate hunger with relative inflation and with differential profitability? So this is very stunning and it is kind of reflective of the nature of his work because most of it is on really differential stagflation. So he looks at differential prices, he looks at differential inflation, and he looks at differential price volatility. So all those aspects of prices, uh, instead of just looking at the so-called reality of production of food, he says that the superstructure of prices can actually tell us quite a lot about the dynamics of power in the food regime. So he takes different phenomena, for example, <clears throat> 
He looked at the slowdown of Walmart. The Walmart is kind of a giant that grew in leaps and bounds, but eventually it started to level off. And it leveled off because its policy of cutting costs is not enough, where everybody else is actually raising prices. So it was kind of a study of the asymptotes of power of Walmart based on the notion of differential inflation. Same thing, he looked at the so-called supermarket supremacy thesis, the argument that over the past 20 years, supermarkets have come to rule the world, and he showed that this, is, this kind of a conventional creed is just false. If you look at differential profitability, the supermarkets have retreated, and they retreated because relative prices of finished goods relative to intermediate goods have fallen. And what is behind that? Uh, he looked at the uh, transition and the sacrifice of food for fuel, for biofuel specifically. So how governmental policy of encouraging biofuels is actually contributing to world hunger at the same time that it's serving dramatically certain groups that actually produce biofuels and undermining others. So prices are an, an incredibly important lever in organizing power at the global level of the food regime. So that's very fascinating work, I think. Uh, Troy Cochran, who is sitting here uh, and uh, is uh, soon to defend his dissertation and will be delivering here, delivering here the closing presentation in the series, uh, concentrated on the beers, the global diamond cartel. And the question that he raised in his dissertation uh, may seem quite simple to ask, but it's very, very difficult to answer. And that is, if you look at differential capitalization and differential profitability, these are singular numbers or singular series, quantitative and quite unambiguous. But, but they essentially represent a series of power processes, all of which are quite different from one another. So you have qualitative differences in power, and all of them are somehow being reduced to a uniformity of differential capitalization and differential profitability, and how is that process uh, occurring? So he focused on a particular period of time, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he focused on the transition between the, the 1930s and the 1940s, so that's kind of around the breakout of the Second World War, and there's an interesting kind of V-shape. So you see that from the 1920s and 30s, uh, the beer sees its differential profitability falling, and then suddenly, uh, around the breakout of the Second War, it's rising. The question is, why? So he focused on, A, the way that you change the relationship between uh, love and diamonds, how the beer has actually created this custom that if you love somebody and you marry them, then you have to buy a diamond ring. Yeah. So this was you know, something that the beer has created. And what was the process that uh, it took to actually create this tradition? And then he looked at the role of the war and how the war had a very important relationship with the beer because of industrial diamonds for the production of precision instruments. Thirdly, he looked at the way that the beer engaged with governments. So it's a relationship between so-called capital and state. And it was very interesting uh, differences between interactions with different governments. And finally, he looked at the institution of family ownership in a period in which uh, families are declining in favor of institutions and sort of anonymous forms of ownership. And this kind of a fusion between these different qualitative <coughs> processes and the quantitative differential accumulation results they lead to uh, makes, uh, I think, a fascinating dissertation. Uh, Blair Fix, who is sitting next to Troy here, uh, looked at another conversion, uh, not from quality to quantity, but from quantity to quantity. And he looked essentially at the conversion of energy to hierarchy. Uh, as I already noted, the key problem with conventional uh, economic theory is that it's not clear exactly how do we measure the real economy and what exactly is growing. <clears throat> because we measure things in utility, and if utility doesn't exist, then the growth measures that we convince ourselves are there are or could be thought of as being quite meaningless. So to say the economy is growing at 3% or 2%, and arguing that this is some sort of a measure of happiness is a very dubious concept, because utils are a measure of happiness. 
So what uh, Blair Fix is doing, among other things, is saying, look, when you talk about growth, what we do know for a fact is that growth has to do with the extent of conversion of energy. How much energy of a particular kind and how much energy in general is converted to some sort of a useful, to do some sort of useful work from a physics perspective. And it turns out that this is something we can measure. And what we can measure is the effect, he argues, uh, on the institutions that we have, and particularly on hierarchies. It turns out that the more energy we convert as a society, the more hierarchical the institutions that result out of that conversion. So the conversion of energy, instead of resulting in some sort of increase in well-being, which is a dubious quantitative concept, definitely results in a quantitative process, namely the increases or decreases in the hierarchical structure of society. And it documents it, and it uh, results in quite a fascinating, I think, uh, articulation of something that uh, few if, or, or any researchers have, have ever done. Uh, they're all aligned here for some reason <laughs> on the same side of the table, uh, to my left, uh, of course. Uh, so James McMahon uh, deals with a, another conversion uh, altogether, and that's the conversion uh, of cultural destruction into lower risk. Uh, he's a PhD student at SPT, and uh, he, he will also be defending um, very shortly. Uh, and what he did was to try to deconstruct uh, the logic of Hollywood from a caste perspective. And the question that he asks uh, is, again, quite simple. If you look at the differential performance of profitability of the leading Hollywood firms, you see that it's nothing much to write home about. In other words, these firms do not really beat the average as far as their profitability is concerned, certainly not in any systematic way. But if you look at differential capitalization, and it's zooming. So differential profitability goes sideways. Differential capitalization is zooming. How is that possible? Well, if they reduce the differential risk, in other words, the risk is falling faster than the average, then that boosts accumulation tremendously. So his question is, how did they do it? How did they, the, the Hollywood firms manage historically over the past 20 or 30 or so years, manage to reduce their risk so dramatically. And many of you might be too young to remember, but once upon a time, specifically in the 60s and 70s, Hollywood actually managed to produce a fair number of good films. Uh, but this area, era is kind of gone now, more or less. And it's gone for two reasons. First, the main big entertainment conglomerates learned how to shape, how to mold, and how to restrict and harness creativity. Uh, to their own accumulation ends. And also, on the other hand, they managed to uh, condition the consuming public to actually consume what they deliver. So they managed to kind of uh, really construct uh, the creation of culture and the consumption of culture in a way that is highly predictable. And that made blockbuster films very predictable. Very predictable meaning much lower risk. Much lower risk means faster accumulation and faster differential accumulation. So that's another kind of conversion of qualities of power into quantities of power. And uh, James documented it in a very stunning way, I think. Uh, Marc-André Gagnon, uh, another uh, person who looked at capitalist power, investigated intellectual property rights and specifically focused on the big pharmaceutical businesses. So he was looking essentially at how the pharmaceutical businesses leverage the state through intellectual property rights and showed quite systematically through his dissertation that in fact these firms over the past 20 or 30 years have had a dramatic decline in therapeutic innovations. So the number of drugs, the quality of drugs and so on, the new drugs that they invent tend to go down at the same time that the differential accumulation rises. So again, you have a process of differential capitalization through differential sabotage. Uh, Brian Sandy Hager, uh, who will be presenting here again in this series, looks not at the indirect, but the direct leverage of the state. So intellectual property rights 
capitalize the state indirectly. Uh, the national debt capitalizes the state directly. So social scientists like to speak about the state as that entity that is sovereign. So the, the states can tax, they can uh, print money, they can redistribute income, they're free to do it, they're sovereign in that way. But when you think about it more closely, much of this power is in fact owned, literally. It's owned by the creditors of the government, those who own the debt. So we're talking about investors, we're talking about corporations, we're talking about foreign governments, we're talking about international institutions, they own the national debt. Just look at what happened to the Greek government over the past year. It's a government that is literally owned by its creditors and the creditors told it what to do and it does it. So exactly what is the sovereignty here, you should ask. So the national debt is kind of the chief method of the capitalist state bondage, if you like, and that's what Sandy is working on. Now, if bonded governments are in fact owned by creditors, who are those creditors? And it turned out that until Sandy, uh, Leonard Cohen was in the wrong, nobody knew. In fact, Sandy was the first person, he's now doing his postdoc at Harvard, uh, he's the first person to document it in the US, to look at exactly who owns the debt at the uh, household, corporate, and global level in the US. And it was such an impressive piece of research that the Gillian Tett of the Financial Times wrote a half page full, in, full review of his work. Uh, another student of mine, uh, Miladin Ostrogic, who is now working for Statistics Canada in Ottawa, did uh, very interesting work on differential taxation when we speak <coughs> about the state. You know, a lot of people claim that uh, the recent financial crisis was originated in the US, it was original, originated in the banking sector. And it was driven mainly by the deregulation of that sector by the state. So what Miladin has done is to examine the performance of the banking sector. And he showed that on the one hand, the banking sector was outbeating the average, outperforming the average. So it achieved differential accumulation when you look at uh, the net profits of the banking sector. But at the same time, he showed that the differential tax rates so the tax rates of the banking sector relative to the average were rising at the same time that its differential performance, the differential performance of that sector was rising at the same as well. So this is kind of an interesting thing. What, what that meant was that the sector was progressively deregulated. Its pre-tax profit was rising relative to the average at very sort of neck-breaking pace. At the same time, that rates of tax taxation were rising relative to the average. So a growing portion of those rising pre-tax profits were going to the government. But even though a growing portion of taxes went to the government, that left enough net profit for the banking sector to still be the average. So both of those sides were benefiting from the deregulation, which might explain why this deregulation continued all the way until the crisis hit. So that was a good reason for him to get a job in Ottawa because of this paper. No, I'm serious. Uh, now, I, I wanna mention two other uh, people who uh, didn't do their PhD with me, but nevertheless uh, were uh, working on CASP. Uh, one of them is Sean Stars, who is now teaching in Hong Kong, and he did his work on the American empire, uh, and most specifically on the extent to which uh, the global power of uh, U.S. transnational corporations is increasingly projected by its diversification abroad. And although this uh, work of his is not necessarily in agreement uh, with our conclusions, uh, it nevertheless engages with the approach, uh, perhaps in quite an effective way. So it's very interesting uh, research. I'm sure it helped him get a job uh, in Hong Kong. And last but not least, Tim DiMuzio is kind of a multi-casper, I call him, uh, because he publishes so much. Uh, he's the editor of the new review of Capital as Power, Recasp. And uh, he has already written like three or four books on Recasp, on uh, Capital as Power. So he wrote about the, the debt, about the 1%, about energy, a collected volume, and he's writing, as far as I know, two more books as we speak.
So this gives you some sort of a cross section of what kind of work is done by graduate students. Now, as much as I'm impressed by these works, and I'm not impressed by them because I'm the supervisor, I'm impressed by them, period, because I think that they are independent works. And actually, they confirm my uh, goal when I always work with students. I always tell students, my purpose is to make myself redundant. So you don't need me. You stand on your own feet. You run on your own feet. You actually win the race on your own feet. And, and these works, I think, prove that beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, anybody would agree with that reading them. But I think as much as I'm excited about it, these are just starts because of the radical nature of caste, because it goes against, certainly against neoclassical economics, but it also deviates, although it agrees a lot with Marxism, it still deviates on very uh, important uh, questions from Marxism, and then everything needs to be done from scratch. So we have essentially only scratched the surface, including the works of the graduate students here. It's just the beginning. And because it's just the beginning, I think that it's worthwhile thinking of what might uh, be useful to do into the future. And maybe some of you might be interested in doing research on that subject, uh, might find the last part of my presentation uh, suggestive. And what I'll try to do is to sp speculate or specify some trajectories that I think are important to investigate. And after that, we can get to questions and answers. So let me begin with two very basic questions. What do we mean when we say that capital is power? And what do we mean when we say that capital is a mode of power? Now Marx, who uh, in some sen sense inverted uh, Hegel's idealism, sort of put Hegel on his feet, claimed that the capitalist system was a specific mode of production. So it was preceded by earlier modes of production, uh, specifically slavery and feudalism, among others. Now, if we claim that capitalism is a mode of power as opposed to a mode of production, that doesn't mean that production doesn't take place, but it means that it's more useful to think about it as a mode of production and then understand production, sorry, mode of power and understand production as part of it. We are implicitly suggesting that it's not the only mode of power, that there could have been and there were and there still are other modes of power. So capital, capitalism is one of several modes of power. Moreover, when we argue that capital is not a thing that generates utility or comprises dead labor, but that it is a symbolic representation of power, we raise the obvious question, what do we exactly mean by power? In other words, what concept of power underlies specifically the capitalist mode of power? And, and these are two questions that Shimshon and I are currently working on. They're very big questions. They're actually more appropriate for scholars who are in their 30s rather than in our age. But nevertheless, that's what we're working on, and we'll see how far we can go with it. And our tentative view is that modes of power and concepts of power are joint historical entities. So the ancient empires and city-states, say, of, uh, of uh, Mesopotamia and of Egypt, uh, insofar as they constituted a mode of power, they had their own unique concepts of power. And these concepts of power are not the ones that we use now. Similarly, if we think of feudalism, if we can think of feudalism as a mode of power, and there are different forms of feudalism as well, they too use concepts of power that are quite different from the concepts of power we use, utilize in capitalism. And the same thing applies to capitalism. So we call this entity COP-MOP, concept of power, modes of power, mode of power. So there are different COP-MOPs in history. It's not that the same concept of power is used always in different modes of power. <clears throat> now, this enfoldment of concepts and modes of power is our starting point. And if this enfoldment is to prove useful, the next step is to characterize what do we mean by a particular cop mop? How does it characterize itself? 
So we need to identify what are the properties of a COP mop. How does a COP mop operate? How does it transform itself? What causes it to break down? So these are historical theoretical questions. And the purpose here is really to situate the capitalist mode of power, concept of power, in a broader historical theory of concepts of power and modes of power. And of course, these are questions that cannot be dealt by a single person or two people. They are very, very big questions and they cannot be solved quote unquote quickly, but it's really important to spell them out. So we have some sort of a vision of what we are talking about. So these are the most general questions I think that can be asked with respect to concepts of power and modes of power. Now, if we are to zoom from that general perspective of history down to the capitalist mode of power, we reach a, the unavoidable question of the origins. And here we inevitably run into Aristotle's telus that connects to you, Christian, here. Uh, many of you would be intimately familiar with the transition debate from feudalism to capitalism. In fact, York has a special place in that debate because many professors here espouse the notion of political Marxism uh, as a way of understanding uh, this transitionary period. Now, in Marxism, the teleological endpoint of the transition debate is the 19th century, and specifically, Marx's concept of capital. So that means that Whatever was born in the transition from, cap from feudalism to capitalism had to contain in it the embryo, the seed of industrial capital and wage labor, because that's the advanced nature of capital that Marx saw in his head, writing in the middle of the 19th century. That's the twin engine of exploitation and accumulation. However, if we follow not Marx, but Casp, then the teleology is very different because we, our end point is not 19th century factories with wage labor. Our end point essentially is symbolic discounted power. So essentially we are looking for different things in the past and we might find it elsewhere. We might find it in a different period of time. It might work completely differently. So always when we look for an origin, we have in the back of our mind some teleological endpoint to which this origin should lead? And of course, this is an important question, uh, and it still is waiting for the first researcher. So, hasn't been investigated yet. Now, perhaps the key clue in this type of search is finance. The organizing ritual of the capitalist creator, we believe, is capitalization. In other words, the discounting to present value of risk-adjusted expected future earnings excuse the complicated concept, but once you get used to it, it's really very simple. Now, we have started to explore this ritual, uh, historically and analytically, but in the grand scheme of things, again, this is just scratching the surface. And there is a huge literature on finance, but virtually none of it is examined from the viewpoint of CASP. Furthermore, there's a huge literature that tries, depending on the ideology of the writer, to either connect or disconnect finance from power. But our point is that you shouldn't really connect finance and power. You should think of finance and capitalization in general as being the architecture of power. So it's not an, a different entity from power. And here again, uh, if you look at teleology, you start from the present and you ask, what are the elementary particles of capitalization? And can we find those elementary particles maybe say in the 12th century. How did they evolve? How did those components evolve as reflections of power relations? What was the actual history? Now, once you start unzipping that, maybe you'll come up with different elementary particles just as physicists, when they unpack the atom in their mind, in their instruments, come up with new particles. So it's not sure at all that we are going to remain with the same theories. Uh, we start with something and end up with something else, possibly. That's kind of the dialectics between uh, induction and deduction. Now, a parallel and perhaps no less problematic research trajectory, and again, this kind of research on finance is waiting for the first explorer. So all of those are open trajectories. Uh, a parallel and perhaps uh, 
equally difficult, if not more difficult trajectory is, is the state. Again, the conventional creed is that the state belongs to politics, economics, duality. You can think about the world as having an economic production, civil society sphere. This is where capital is situated. And then you have uh, a politics, authority, power sphere, and that's where the state situates. But what happens if you take the cusp view in which capitalism is a mode of power and capital is power. So where do you situate the state and where do you situate capital in this division between politics and economics? Now, if you go back to Mesopotamia, the first historical society, we know that the state was born there as a form of a structure of power. So it wasn't called the state, but we can think about it of a way of organizing power. And, and, and we borrow from that kind of origin by suggesting that we need to split the world in maybe a different way. There are two organizations that are key to capitalism, and these are corporations and governments. And then there are two more abstract entities that uh, are state and capital, and we shouldn't conflate them. And what we suggested was that we can think of the state in this context as being the mode of power of society. So there's the feudal state, or there's the ancient state, or there's the capitalist state. And these are not specific organizations, but they are reflective of the mode of power of society. So the state of capital, we suggested, was equivalent to the capitalist mode of power. Now, again, this is very tentative. It, it's the opening shot. And we haven't done you know, terribly rigorous research about the subject. We just suggested this kind of classification. And I think. And what needs to be done here is to try to figure out if this notion of the state of capital is actually shedding more light or less light on the interaction and possible fusion of governments and corporations. For example, if you take the notion of monetary policy, of intermediaries, financial intermediaries, banks, and so on, this kind of amalgam accounts for maybe a quarter of all profits in a capitalist society. And it's kind of interesting to, to think of whether it's better analyzed as an interaction of state and capital, or maybe some sort of a fusion of state and capital. And, and the only way to kind of flesh out those concepts is to do historical empirical work about it. A similar subject is the use of big data that is going to become very, very important in the next 50 years. So we know that from Snowden, and we know that from Google, and we know that we are constantly under investigation, so to speak. But, but these are superstructures that are created with governments and corporations. And how do we examine their cooperation? Is this useful to think of state against capital versus capital? Or maybe there's something else being created with the use of big data. So you can apply this question to almost anything that governments and corporations do because they're always together. So again, that's kind of still uh, open territory for you to investigate. Now, productivity and labor is front and center of the Marxist notion of the mode of production. Uh, Industrial productive labor creates surplus. The surplus is being appropriated and exploitation in that way enables accumulation. So understanding productive labor and understanding the negation of productive labor, meaning unproductive labor, is the key to understanding the entire Marxist mode of production. And in this context in which surplus value explains exploitation, therefore explains accumulation, and therefore is linked together, uh, sorry, uh, intimately to labor, the question that Marxists ask me always is quite natural. All right, what about labor? You know, what does Casp has to say about labor and about production more generally? I think that both are very important to Casp. However, Casp is not about the appropriation of surplus labor. It's about the capitalization of power. So if we are to understand the role of labor and production, we need to understand how they are mediated through power. In other words, in what way and in which way labor and production are molded, are shaped, and creorder to 
basically give structure to the way that the underlying population fits into the capitalist mode of power, into capitalist discipline. So it's, an, it, it's a slightly different question that we ask on the paper, but it is a very different question when you actually built an analytical structure. So one way to think about this difference is to go back to Democritus, the Greek philosopher that invented the atom. And why do I invoke Democritus? Well, when human beings are locked into slavery or when they are locked into a feudal hierarchy, their position in the power structure and therefore the power structure itself is very rigid and very, very static. But in capitalism, one of the important things in capitalism is that it liberated people in the sense that it made them into independent atoms. They are independent of one another. And they are like modular pieces. They can be moved around. In fact, that enabled the capitalist system to be infinitely more flexible and infinitely more dynamic than prior systems as a system of power. So it is this flexibility, I think, and dynamism, the creation of a wage earner, the creation of a labor force that is independent and is paid and is very, very flexible, it is very much akin to the uh, creation of hired armies that the communes of the Bourg were first to institute in the beginning of the transition to capitalism, maybe. And together with the emergence of large-scale commodity trading, all of this is a shift towards Democritus. It's a shift towards creating atoms that then can be rearranged in infinitely dynamic and complex ways. And in that sense, it represents a shift to a different way of organizing power. So the labor process of wage earners is very different than the labor process of slaves or the labor processes of a uh, uh, feudal way of organizing society. And I think it's a prerequisite for the capitalization of power. Maybe this is a way of investigating it. Uh, so in order to ask the question, to answer the question, what about labor? We need to unzip the role that labor played in organizing power and capitalism. And I'm reminded always when I ask this question of the famous article that uh, Stefan Moglin wrote from Harvard in 1974, and it's worthwhile reading. It's called, uh, What Do Bosses Do? And it is an his historical examination, and Moglin shows that every time that capitalists or prior rulers of society, non-capitalist societies, adopted technology, the key thing is that that technology should increase the power of the rulers over the subjects even if that increase of the power of the rulers over the subject undermines efficiency, and even if it comes at the cost of lower profit. And this is kind of very interesting because it emphasizes power, but I think it's also misleading because in capitalism, uh, because Moglin is, or was a Marxist, I don't know if he's still a Marxist, but he certainly was writing that uh, from a viewpoint of a Marxist, uh, There is this assumption that somehow uh, in capitalism, power and profitability are uh, antithetical to one another. But if you take the CASP approach, that's not the case at all. In fact, power is a prerequisite for profit. So it's not a contradiction at all. So that might be kind of a starting point to think of labor rather than creating a surplus, but really a form of organizing power in society on a very large scale, because obviously the labor process takes between half and third of the day uh, of almost everyone who participate in the society. So immediately we're talking about uh, a major chunk of the power structure. Uh, <clears throat> it always is frustrating when you misallocate the pages. Uh, so, Another possibly uh, much broader trajectory, and I'm going to finish in five minutes, uh, is the way in which the capitalist mode of power is embedded and is dependent on and transforms the planetary environment. So the key fossi here are 
possibly climate change, uh, energy, specifically peak energy, and the transformation and possible hindrance of life itself. Now, there's already a humongous literature on the relationship between capitalism and uh, these focal points, but I think that in some sense, this literature is one-sided. It tends to assume somehow that environmental change is a byproduct or externality of capitalism, and the reason is capitalism is viewed as uh, very narrowly focused and very short-sighted. The idea is that the only thing that counts is profit, and profit now, not even in the long term. So under those circumstances, capitalists are conditioned to worry only about their profitability here and now, and to disregard everything else, even though that might actually bring their own demise eventually. So the result is destruction that the capitalists can do nothing about, but that's a byproduct. That's usually kind of the starting hy uh, hypothesis. And I don't think that this is necessarily wrong, but I think it tells only uh, one half of the story. The reason is that changes to our environment and changes to life itself and the impact these changes have on accumulation and the structure of capitalism, uh, all of those things are highly differential. So just consider the recent case of Volkswagen, for example, or more importantly, the case of Exxon. It turns out that Exxon knew about climate change already in the 1980s, and instead of making this a public issue and doing something about it, it used it for its own purpose, for its own differential advantage, and hid it. Uh, well, that's just one illustration. If you look at water problems, if you look at peak energy, population movement, genetic engineering, species extinction, mass pollution, all of those problems, quote unquote, they might all be harmful, but they're not necessarily harmful to everybody, and they're certainly not harmful in the same way. So therefore, there is an enormous opening for leveraging those problems, not just kind of thinking about them in terms of externalities, things that happen and we don't care about. On the contrary, we use them actually in order to differentially accumulate, and perhaps by doing so, aggravating them. And again, this kind of inquiry hasn't been done to the best of my knowledge. And my, the best of my knowledge is not very best, actually, because I'm not an expert on the subject. But from what I have seen so far, from the little that I've read uh, so far, nobody has investigated that kind of more clearly in terms of <coughs> the differential nature of environmental change and how it affects differential accumulation. So that will be a very interesting kind of inquiry. And again, uh, we are looking for the first Examiner. Last but not least, accounting. When the Soviet Union was on its last leg, the Kremlin sent satellites into outer space. Why? In order to figure out how much grain the country was producing. Why would it need to do that? Well, the ruling class no longer trusted its own accounting system. And the accounting system in society is the language of power. Capitalist accounting was born early in the second millennium. Uh, and it has since developed into a very complex ritual that governs your life, whether you know it or not, all the way from the very superstructures of kind of organizing capitalism all the way down to the very details of your everyday life. And by the beginning of the third millennium, in other words, in our era, the ritual shows signs of disintegration, I think, capitalist accounting. And that's not unprecedented. We had a similar disintegration happening in the beginning of the 20th century in physics. So the Newtonian ontological perspective to physics was giving rise to a semi-ontological and perhaps even non-ontological view based on relativity and quantum. And that made a lot of difference in physics. And I think the same thing is happening at the end of the 20th century uh, and beginning of the 21st to political economy. So the inability to distinguish between real and nominal in economics, which is fundamental. Without it, there is no economics. That's very serious. The growing problem with the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, the very wild behavior of Tobin's Q, for those of you who know what it is. Uh, the prevalence of massive financial fraud, which means that you cannot trust the numbers. All of those things are just few processes that show or illustrate signs of increasing fractures.
of a language of power that is increasingly at odds with the changing reality. Now, Marx predicted that mechanization is going to eventually undermine the labor theory of value and break down the way that the ruling class understood the processes of accumulation. And that would mean that the ruling class would no longer trust its own understanding of the process, and therefore, capitalism would implode. Now, the labor theory of value has been discredited even by most Marxists since then, but capitalism is still standing. And how is that possible? Because the neoclassicists have introduced a different form of accounting based not on labor, but based on utility. And this utility-based accounting is disintegrating now, in my opinion. Yet critical political economists, no matter how much they wave their hands, have nothing to replace it with. And that's really important. It creates a void that is very, very dangerous, more dangerous than anything, I think. We no longer live in a paleolithic society of hunters and gatherers and small packs that are just roaming the landscape looking for food. And we no longer live in uh, small neolithic villages. We live in a highly complex society. We have more than 7 billion people in the world. And we need a radically new accounting system a system that is based not on snout, that is based not on utils, but on new categories, and maybe not even on power, but on new categories that will enable us to develop democratic accounting. Because without accounting, we are doomed in complexity. And if we don't begin to develop this system now, the crisis of capitalism might meet us without an alternative. And if you cannot think your way through complexity, then complexity is going to take you to the cleaners. So this is really important. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. OK, we have time for questions and answers. We're going to take one question at a time. Uh, and when you ask your question, if you can please ask it into the microphone. And there's two others on the table down there. Well, I might exercise my privilege of holding the microphone to ask a question. Uh, I think we heard some results that probably surprised you at the time, but can you tell us something you tried that failed? What do you mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, let me think about it. Yeah. Uh, Example, uh, we wrote a piece on systemic fear and systemic crisis in which we thought that we discovered uh, a quantitative indicator for the fear of capitalists. And that indicator was based on the model of capitalization. So we thought that we discovered periods in which the capitalization formula fails. Capitalization depends on earnings, on hype, and on interest rates. It should depend on all of them. But when capitalists are fearful, we thought, then they would stick to things that they can see. And instead of looking at future earnings, instead of looking at risk, instead of looking at hype and the normal rate of return, they'll stick to past profits. So that would be indication of systemic fear. Systemic because the basic model of their understanding is shunned away, and they fall back to some sort of instinctive thing that they can see under their nose. And therefore, whenever we see very close correlation between profitability, past profit, and asset prices, that's an indication of systemic fear. So we published a paper on it. And then um, Andrew Kleeman, uh, is an, uh, a Marxist political economist, showed us that actually there are other periods in which this correlation existed. And uh, certainly, these periods could not be considered to be systemic fear. So we were definitely wrong in the way that we presented it. And we needed to kind of rethink this type of, of analysis. Another example would be. Uh, the, the model that we uh, developed in the late 80s of 
military conflicts, energy conflicts in the Middle East. And it seems that this model might uh, be breaking down now. So again, uh, that's an il illustration of, uh, you know, you have wishful thinking, you want the model to continue and uh, operate as expected and to be very robust, but history might change and the principles that govern power might not be the same now uh, compared to what they were in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So um, if I think uh, with, uh, you know, more, I probably can come with more examples uh, that are kind of easy to, to explain, but there, there were plenty of those, actually. Uh, two, are, two are enough, I think. Yes, Daniel. Um, <clears throat> but you need to speak to the mic. Yeah. Um, so you, you pointed to two different types of like things, um, differential capitalization and differential profit. What exactly is the difference between differential capitalization? Because you said there's companies that have the same differential profit, but their differential capitalization has gone up. What, what, what distinguishes the, between the two? <clears throat> well, capitalization is the market value of a firm. So if the firm, just for illustration purposes, has a million share outstanding, uh, shares outstanding and the price is $10 a share, the company will be capitalized at $10 million. As the price of the share fluctuates, then the overall capitalization of the firm will change. That's capitalization. Profitability is essentially the income that capitalization is discounting. So the price of a share is a way of saying, what do I as an investor think the firm is going to generate in the future in terms of profit? And how do I take all this stream of profit that I project into the future and put a price on it? So the price of a share is a way of translating my future vision of profitability into a single number here and now that I'm willing to pay for or well, I'm willing to sell for the share. So it's possible that profits are going to behave in a way that is different than capitalization because capitalization looks into the future and profits are here now. Blair. So you, you mentioned uh, big data uh, as something to be aware of in the future. Um, and I thought maybe I'd ask you about the connection between theory and, and uh, what's happening right now. So uh, the theory of the firm was that profits were maximized. This is the neoclassical theory of the firm and uh, um, <clears throat> famous studies in the 1930s. I forget the name of the guys who did it, but they just asked businesses if they, Holland, how they behaved. Holland yeah, Holland Hitch. And of course, nobody was behaving according to neoclassical principles. And I was reading in the New York Times that Target now uses big data to predict the behavior of consumers that they can predict, for instance, if a woman is going to be pregnant, because pregnancy is a time when there's massive changes in uh, consumer buying habits. And I thought, you know, this kind of nullifies the, uh, the whole neoclassical vision of the utility maximizer, because they're using habits to predict how people behave. And this is the same kind of thing. And I was just wondering if you might comment. I mean, this is corporations are using big data all the time. Um, what as researchers do you think we should be doing to use it wisely or to, I don't know, use it for our own purposes? Well, I mean, it, it, if I were to start investigating big data, I would ask the simplest questions and I would try to answer the things that I don't know and I don't know almost everything so uh, what is big data first of all you know how is this defined in the literature so I would read about what big data is uh, 
what, is the, what are the different ways that big data are analyzed? Who collects the big data? So I'd ask really very preliminary types of questions on what it is, who uses it, for what purpose. These are things that I'm not sure I know. I mean, I have vague ideas because I, I'm reading, just as you do, uh, more popular stuff about it. I know because uh, computerized access to all of your actions on the internet uh, and through your phones is accessible to the firms that actually provide the services. So they can create maps of orders that actually are completely inaccessible to us. So they create a new reality, and that reality is conceived in their heads, but is not completely independent of the facts. In fact, it is constructed with the facts, but with some ideas about regularities. So the first thing that I would do is find the institutional arrangements, the organizational arrangements that actually govern the use of big data. Uh, way before I start to kind of theorize how it is being used in great detail. I just don't know. But I know that it is inaccessible to me, and I would like it to be accessible. I can't answer any more than that, I think, at this point, because I'm just not privy to this information. But I wish uh, I had somebody here, or more than one person, uh, with some ability to deal with uh, computerized techniques, uh, to start investigating it, because I think that's the future leverage of power that is terribly important. If you know, you have access to big data, for example, in the natural environment, such as Exxon. So Exxon was kind of, you know, roaming the world, and they have a fantastic scientific apparatus. Then they figured it out already in the 1980s. I think that, uh, what's his name? The NASA, famous NASA scientist, about Jim Henson, uh, you know, only in the 90s, you know, came up. With, with this claim about climate change, or maybe slightly earlier, but they, they were kind of ahead of the game. And they have access to big data, and that big data is entirely proprietary to them. And what do they do with it? So what exactly is big data? What are the kind of chunk of information that the capitalist ruling class, governmental organizations are interested in it? S some, some is related to accumulation immediately, some is not related to accumulation immediately. It is related to the natural environment. It might be related to transportation. You know, how do you actually manage transportation system with big data? But almost all of it can be made relevant to accumulation because accumulation is about creordering the world of power. So all of it is relevant. But I just don't even have the basics. I completely admit that. I don't know the first thing about it in any serious way. It's completely impressionistic. But it seems to me that this is... You know, once we give up uh, copyrights, it sounded like copyrights was a big deal, you know, about a particular patent, a particular piece of, of written material and so on. This is Mickey Mouse stuff relative to big data because here you have the construction of something completely new and that thing is, is not protected by copyrights. It's simply protected and not shared with anybody. So it's kind of a new level of knowledge that is created, is completely removed from the underlying population. And it's very dangerous because it's done entirely either in private ways, l literally private ways, or is done in private ways that are dominated by governmental organization, but it's still private because it's not public. So this is something that is very important for the control structure of the world. It's terribly important, and we don't know much about it. At least I don't. So it seems to me kind of a major CASP project. Thank you. Uh, this is the first time hearing this. It's uh, really interesting. Um, I don't know where to start my question because you kind of do a lot of different things. And um, it's interesting how you sort of combine uh, science and an ideology critique in the sense that you uh, are also criticizing uh, orthodox economics and you're relying on the science to criticize uh, the orthodox economics. Uh, but then uh, the science in itself al almost becomes a motivating ideology and the drive to more data and like and pursuing and refining the, the theoretical categories. And as I was kind of reflecting on this, I was thinking what's, you're sort of saying that the, the, the main thing is um, the creordering and the, 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 this capitalization. What explains though this 
what motivates and drive and explains is a drive towards uh, capitalization. This is more a deeper, broader theoretical question, but you sort of seem to have a, a trajectory that seems really similar to, reminds me a little bit of Weber and rationalization on the one hand, or uh, uh, in the Frankfurt School, you have a similar thing in the dialectic of enlightenment where uh, there's this motivation to instrumental reason. And I'm just wondering, uh, what do you see as 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 motivating that 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 drive to capitalization? What sustains it? What's driving sort of capitalist thinking? You know, is it where do they get those interests and desires from? What is what is that thing? Because it seems to me to be at the root of it. Uh, well, I I don't think that I want to comment on the psychological basis of it, but I I think that uh, the drive for power is institutionalized in a way that it was not previously institutionalized in history. So uh, rulers always are driven to power. We know that historically. What causes the human species to be driven to power and what exactly do we mean by it is, is a, I think, not an easy question to answer. And, and many people would claim that uh, it's not unique to the animal we call human beings, and it's shared by many other species, maybe most species. Uh, so this is not a question that I think I can answer intelligently, and maybe nobody can, uh, but certainly I can't. But what I can say is that the drive to power is institutionalized in capitalism in ways that it wasn't institutionalized in past societies because of the atomization of, of capitalism. So say if you go back to Sumer or to uh, to ancient Egypt or other, you know, first civilization. So civilization that started from scratch. So maybe in South America you have later civilizations, but they are first civilizations because they haven't, you know, copied other civilizations. And all of them have, you know, hierarchical structures. So all of them are structured by power in one way or the other. But in capitalism, it's the first time that those, that everybody, all the way from the top to the bottom, to the bottom is actually driven by the same type of algorithm. Uh, the algorithm of capitalization and differential capitalization, we are being conditioned from the very beginning of our lives to kind of think in those terms. And therefore, we are pulled into this logic of beating the average from early on. And by, by being pulled into it, we become part of this order. We become part of this power-driven order. We can't even help it. So if you are a capitalist, you have to participate in that power process. You are conditioned to do it even without knowing it. Now, of course, as you rise up and as you move from being an owner of a million dollars to being an owner of 10 million and then 100, and then in the billions, you slowly realize, if you are smart, you quickly realize, that you deal with power. It's quite obvious as you go up that this is about power. When you are at the bottom, you still think that this is something about your well-being, that you're just trying to do better. But if you stop and you say, I've got $5 million and I'm just well enough, then obviously you're not part of that structure. And very, very few people are able to ever stop. I think that in the US, uh, I read at some point that about half of the US population even including people above 40 or 50 years old, still believe that they're going to be rich. Now, that is a reflection of something. It's a reflection of a drive that they're being conditioned in a particular way to constantly be the average, constantly be more than they are, constantly be more than others. Now, that's a logic that is imposed on them. Uh, uh, now, I'm not saying that it's entirely imposed on them because it probably utilizes some psychological genetic you know, feature of that species. But it's certainly not, I don't think that it's something that is uh, common to all civilizations. It is common to capitalist civilization. So capitalism has been able to generate, I think, a structure that goes all the way to the DNA of society that conditions everybody to search for and actually achieve power if they can. Now, some people give it up, okay, because they, they get completely discouraged, for sure. But, but the possibility is there for everybody to do it. And that's quite different than, say, slavery or feudalism, or, you know, the ancient kingships in which, I mean, nobody strives to be a, a pharaoh. You know, it's completely out of the question, right? Uh, 
Uh, but in capitalism, everybody strives to be a Bill Gates if they can. Now, everybody is in inverted comma, but there is a process that conditions people to think that that's a desirable and possible outcome. And in that sense, I think uh, the structure of the power algorithm is very universal in ways that uh, did not exist in prior societies. It's still hierarchical, but everybody believes that they can actually move in that hierarchy, or at least it's possible to move in that hierarchy. And that's really important because it sanctifies, legitimizes this structure. Um, I'm not sure I can fully articulate this question uh, yet, but I'll give it a shot anyways. Um, so you speak of, of capital as a symbolic representation of, of power, and power is something that is relative, not absolute, um, and that differential accumulation is one of the main drives of capitalist history. Um, but I'm wondering, because in, in the way that, you know, the, uh, capitalism uh, of the 19th century and 20th century are, are taught. Uh, there's a f an emphasis on the period periodization, right? Uh, so, like going from, uh, for instance, just like Keynesian to the neoliberal period. And I, I just wonder if, because uh, it doesn't seem, for me, from what I've read of your work, I don't know how to relate these uh, differential processes to these periods of capital, um, because these periods seem like they are defined by their sort of aggregate phenomenon, right? Like neoliberalism, we can talk about, uh, you know, like the decline of, of unions, for instance, or uh, particular trends in state finance. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if your research or if, if this is a question that's been posed, like how we relate these sorts of differential struggles to broader sorts of periodizations, if these periodizations are useful, how we can think about Keynesianism in this concept, context, neoliberalism in this context. Um, well, I think the periodization and the, the specific periods that you spoke about uh, are conceived historically without any reference to CASP. So they originated from a completely different world perspective. Uh, are they relevant? Well, sure they are relevant because they are historically there and a lot of people believe in, in that periodization and therefore it is very real. It's part of the history, it's unfolded, it cannot be undone. So it's there. It's just like neoclassical economics. Is it valid? Well, you can question uh, uh, the validity of that approach, but you cannot question its existence and its dominance over the mind of the experts and the population at large, even if they're not familiar with the concept. So the same thing with this periodization. Uh, to what extent can we think of this periodization in relationship to capitalist power, to the capitalist mode of power, and the evolution of those terms is a question that is still waiting for somebody to research. And uh, the answer will be either that the, the relationship is very clear once you start investigating it, uh, that it's not clear, uh, and maybe we need to think of different periodization, not to eliminate the original periodization, but to kind of invent another way of looking at that history. And um, we have had different thoughts about it, but we have never investigated it seriously. So, you know, that, that's certainly a subject for several PhDs. That's what I, you know, I said. Basically, what we're doing here is writing a new cosmology, and it's endless, right? It's new territory. I don't want to use the term uh, you know, that I used in, in class, but it's new territory. On this side, any questions? This is more of a sort of nuts and bolts question. But Sorry, do you mind taking that? Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, I was just wondering in terms of uh, like the broad, big questions, um, I've always been interested in finding out more about monopoly power, monopsony power in, in Canada 
but it's such a daunting question. Um, for all I know, you know, there could be other people in this room interested in the in the question. Um, is there is there a place or a way where, you know, we could cooperate or? about Canada uh, from a caste perspective. Well, it's true, because uh, I learned uh, very early on to, to say that you know something about something. Uh, it means to research it. And I haven't researched the Canadian political economy. So I, I know very little about it. And whatever I know is uh, from the work that my students have done. And I, I had an, one student, uh, Jordan Brennan, who wrote his dissertation on dominant capital and the history of dominant capital in Canada. So if you wish, uh, you know, I can give you his coordinates and you can start with him because he would be uh, uh, certainly an expert and definitely m more of an expert than I am on the subject. Not only does he know this subject because he investigated it, but he knows the literature quite well and he knows the people who actually investigate that subject quite well. So he would be the first person to speak to. You, you don't want to go this way, you want to go direct. And there is somebody there who uh, has done the first thing about uh, capital and its power in Canada. So it's not the last thing, hopefully, that will be done on Canada. So he opened up many questions that can be further investigated. And uh, just like you know, people write uh, a large number of dissertations about the same subject with variations, then the same thing with Canada. So if you're interested, you can still, it's still kind of a vast area of inquiry. But somebody has already done the first work on it. Sorry, and if I can answer just one other component to that sure. question. Um, it's not that active right now, but there is a forum on capitalspower.com, and it has been quite active in the past. And often where activity would come is when someone has done some very preliminary quantitative research, and they aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have an answer to what they found, or maybe it's not something that they're, you know, looking to investigate further. And you just throw it up there and say, like, what do you think? What do you, you know, what do you make of this? Uh, so I would encourage, you know, if you have a question and you just go and pose the question there, or you start taking some preliminary steps and you get some early findings, I know for sure there are participants on there who would definitely give you some feedback um, on what you found and, and areas to, to carry on um, pushing towards the answers that you're seeking. Forum. So if you go uh, to capitalistpower.com, then you basically go to the forum and just browse and see what's going on there. So a lot of very interesting questions and answers uh, have unfolded over the years. It's really interesting, I think. So you've stated that you'd like to see uh, a broad new uh, research project um, on capital as power. How, how do you stop the topic from hardening as Marxism and neoclassical economics has hardened into an orthodoxy? How do you stop that? I cannot stop it. I don't think I can stop it. I mean, the nature of knowledge is very dialectical. When you don't know anything, you're very flexible. Once you start knowing things, you become rigid because if you believe that something is right, you, you develop a preconception about it and you develop an affinity to it, intellectual affinity, and then you develop an emotional affinity to it. And that's one reason why older people very rarely change their mind because they're just defined by their beliefs emotionally. So I think that it's a danger that lies uh, in the footstep of every inquiry. And it, it's only when we constantly remind ourselves that we are probably wrong in what we're doing. And we are probably wedded to ideas that were maybe initially innovative but slowly fossilized. That, and, and only when we constantly encourage younger people who have we don't have those sandbags to carry with them of knowledge that we encourage them to come in that we are constantly uh, rejuvenated. So I think that's why an autonomous research institute is necessary. So we don't end up with a, as a sort of a clique of old geezers who are just kind of basically know everything. Because if there is no 
influx of young critique that comes in from the outside, it is definitely going to happen. So I'm very aware of it, and I'm constantly reminding myself that once you have people that resemble acolytes, it's time to, you know, abandon ship. The scientific project is over, and you are moving to a realm of religion. So that's why I try to always stay away from saying, uh, you know, this is associated with particular names, and I want to this to think to, to call of this uh, to call this an approach rather than you know to give it names after individuals. I think it's a bad idea, and and you constantly need to think of institutions and and methods of inquiry that will undo. Um, dogmatism, conservatism. It's not enough to say, let's do it. You need to put the institutions. Uh, you need to put the kind of rules and principles that will help you do it. Because otherwise, it's very, very easy to fall back. So I think your question is well taken, and, and this needs to be part of the project itself to make sure that it doesn't develop into orthodoxy. But it can certainly happen. Uh, and it will be a shame if it happens, and I, I don't think it, it is at that stage, but it certainly can be. So the more people coming into it, and the most important thing is to do new research, because new research is the surest method to actually uh, disable that possibility. So you have this student of Pythagoras who said, you think the world is made of rational numbers. What about the square root of two? And you completely undo the orthodoxy, because from then on, it's not just rational numbers, but also irrational numbers. And that can be happening only when you do new research, because all of you who do new research know what happens. Your opinions change, and your conclusions challenge the conclusions of others. And that you can do not because you are brave or you are energetic or something like that, but because you found things that didn't you know, work out. And they worked out in a different way. So new research is the most effective way of sort of putting people in their graves or putting ideas in their graves. I think. So that's why I always run those conferences and those uh, speaker series with students on the premise that we are talking to young students. You cannot change the opinion of established researchers. I've not managed to change the opinion of one person who already was convinced that they had it right. There's no way you can do it. So you need to, uh, to talk to people who are young, energetic, and they want something else. And that's always the audience I'm addressing. And, and that is the surest way to, to prevent orthodoxy. But it's not the safe way. It's, it's not guaranteed, for sure. <laughs>